I'm really excited to introduce you to this week's guest. We have with us Eric Regan today. Uh, Eric is a man of many talents and interests. He's a founder, he's a speaker, he's a coach, and so he's going to be bringing some unique uh, insights to the conversation we're having about scaling your business above and beyond you yourself. So Eric, many of y'all know him with his background with the world-class branding agency focus lab however that's just one facet of of everything that eric is in fact we're going to talk some about his new enterprise built on purpose which is a maxwell certified uh business coaching and mentoring organization he's got a lot of different aspects that he can share with us on how we can be a better how we can scale an organization that really can have a greater impact than we ever could in and of ourselves eric thank you so much for joining good morning market today Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me, Philip. 100%. So um, I'm I'm going to pick up and do a, what I think is a clever segue from uh, my previous interview. I got to speak with Catherine Grant of Expert Care, and she was constantly like all those cool CEOs name dropping all these different books and lessons she's learned from all the books she reads. I did myself some reading this morning. I'm seeing the impressive bookcase behind you and bookshelf for those mm. of y'all who are not watching you're you're listening only the the man's got himself a, a pretty good little library there and on instagram as i was stalking you it shows uh earlier that you read 52 books last year um i need some pro tips and hacks on how i can read more books than than what i'm reading right now because it's not 52. sure yeah yeah so i guess i could go one of two directions i could i could answer that in a general sense for mm -hmm. the sake of an audience or mm -hmm. if you want to go there, I could answer it very specifically for you, and the audience can kind of extract from that. Do you do you want me to go to? Let's Phillip, be selfish. Me to... No, let's be selfish. Let's let's just focus All on right. me, myself, and I. Let's do it, man. So so then I have to start with a question. I I can't I can't answer too many questions without asking a question. I don't know why. It does, maybe it's a defect, but that's just how my brain works. So before I get to the how, tell me why you want to read more books in a year. Right. So uh, I, as I've learned more about myself in terms of just interest, I love, I just love information. I constantly have to be sucking and consuming information. However, uh, you know, what younger Philip would do in at times still does to do is consume lots of sports, sports media, and then, you know, it's become YouTube. And I've learned a lot of stuff from YouTube, but I, yeah. you know, when I can get the right book and in the right mind, I can learn a whole lot of things about a bunch of different disciplines. So I have an eclectic uh, set of interests. I don't want to just read like self improvement books or just read marketing analytics and growth marketing mm -hmm. books, but that does want to be a, a part of it. Obviously, I read the Bible. And so there's a bunch of different books, but books I feel like are one of the greatest mediums, if not the greatest medium for growth and information attainment. So I'm a dad, I'm a husband, I'm a business owner, so I have to cut up my calendar in clever ways to make it happen. Um, but that's part of, I don't know if that really answered your question, but I want to read because I just love knowledge of various yeah. fields. So seek, seeking knowledge, not even in a very specific singular way, but just broadly, you enjoy learning. And I've heard you speak to that in, in previous uh, episodes. Mm -hmm. So your why is that you you want to learn more and and I'm going to, I'm going to, offer an assumption and ask you to confirm it because I've heard you talk a little bit about this in other episodes. Mm -hmm. It sounds like in some cases it's not also just knowledge or it's not just knowledge, but it's also it's discovering the right next actions. Is that fair? Yes. So I, yeah, I mean, I, I love fun facts that that'll help me win uh, Jeopardy, but I, I really love <laughs> like what's time tested and true. So I love the innovation and yeah. the new, but I love just what's been proven and time tested throughout all of history. So I love those yeah. types of subjects. Awesome. That's super helpful. So kind of going toward the how, because that's the question. How, how do I, Philip, read more books this year, even if it's not 52? Um, I, I actually heard you give part of your own answer. I don't know if you noticed when you were describing your answer to why you talked about how you, you enjoy consuming other things. And it mm -hmm. sounded like I may, be a, I may be misapplying something here, but it, it sounded like you were thinking of things you could trade off if you mm -hmm. were going to choose to read more. You mentioned watching sports. You mentioned a few other things. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you and I have the same clock. We got the same 24 mm -hmm. hours. And what works for me might not be exactly what works for you. But mm -hmm. I can tell you, anybody who's trying to read more is going to have to do something less. Mm -hmm. And so that's when it's personal. That's why I ask, you know, do you want to go selfish? And you're like, yeah, let's do it. So, so what do you think you, what are the options for you to kind of give a couple of things up here and there to 
to spend different time reading? I'm going to ask you the question, but then I'll give you some of my own personal answers. Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing that I could uh, divest would be YouTube time. I would say my only, and I, I guess I should just try to see if it works. I would say with my nature of how I prefer to re read as I love to have create time space and solitude where i can really immerse myself into books I, I i've heard a lot of people say one of their their reading hacks is to do everything on audiobook unless i'm in the quiet long car ride and do the audiobook it just doesn't really work for me around the house i'm around the house a lot of times so i could divest youtube time however it's so easy to do a three minute video here and a five minute video there i don't feel like it is easily translates to let me sit down and read for three minutes then put away and then go do back go do, go do whatever i was doing Right, right. So have you, um, bear with me with this next question. Mm -hmm. Based on the last thing you just said, have you tried to just read for three to five minutes and put a book back down? Occasionally. Sometimes if I'm in a, a what I consider like a, what I consider a fun book and I'm not reading because I have to, I find myself that I can read in, in bite sizes more yeah. easily, even though I want to read it for like two hours. Right. So that's great. Um, and I think that you're kind of spot on with kind of like knowing yourself and knowing uh, how to leverage some of your own interests and, and even preferences in how mm -hmm. and when to consume information. Um, so let me just kind of answer maybe the real question, which is how do, how do I do it for, for me? Mm -hmm. and, and is maybe some of this stuff applicable? Um, yeah. My trade-offs uh, early on were basically Netflix or, or just TV shows or streaming uh, series that I just enjoyed watching, I realized, man, I, I spent a lot of time there. Uh, and then when iOS, Apple, when they started showing um, screen time reports on the phone and let mm -hmm. you see how much time you spent on different apps, I was really kind of embarrassed. I'm like, wow, I scroll endlessly on some of these apps way more than I realized. And that's where I realized I had a lot of opportunity to change yeah. how I was investing and spending that time. Now I, I do have, I am one of those people who really enjoys an audiobook, mm -hmm. but I can only consume certain types of books or categories of books in my car, but I do drive a good bit. So mm -hmm. part of the reading that you saw, you know, me mention um, the past few years, I've read 50 ish books each year. Um, audiobooks are absolutely one of the main reasons because I, I drive my kids to school for 35 minutes we do our thing together, but then I drive home silently or sorry, uh, independently. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, that's a great place for me to uh, just listen to audiobooks. And so I have a lot of time where I can do mm -hmm. that. But I do prefer a physical book, as you can, yeah. you know, if you if you see a video right now, you see the, the evidence. I, I, I enjoy a good physical book. Um, so it's just about trade offs. That's really what yeah. it is for me. And that's what it is for each person. And, and knowing yourself, knowing your your opportunities is good. But also, if you have somebody around you who you can maybe like share your idea or your plan with, let them gut check you. Let them say, well, Phil, I mean, you have you tried reading in 15 minute intervals here and there? Have you have you tried doing the thing you said you probably can't benefit from? So have somebody mm -hmm. around you to also help push and stretch you will uh, will will help as well. Yeah, we all need that outside perspective, that that accountability buddy, as I sometimes like to call them. But yeah, that nice. definitely makes sense. I, I, I appreciate that perspective because it genuinely is something I think that's crucial to doing even what we're talking about today is, is I consistently mm -hmm. see the greatest leaders, the greatest entrepreneurs. Um, they're always hungry for knowledge. They're always in that student mindset and they're always looking to learn more books being one of the chief ways to do that. So I appreciate that. Now let's go to something that's uh maybe not necessarily harder, but uh, maybe a grander scale. We talked about addressing mm -hmm. Phillips challenges to reading more books. Now let's talk about uh, roadblocks and challenges to overcome when it comes to scaling a business. Everybody listening to this podcast, even if you don't directly own the company, we're all looking to grow, make more impact, looking to serve more. Um, I myself am when right there with everybody else. I think of you know, and I'm going to put you in the SWOT analysis, kind of to get, just go right into the deep end of the pool. Um, if you got your business plan, folks, if you're gearing up for 2023, you need to be doing your SWOT analysis on your marketing plan and on your business plan. You got your strengths and weaknesses, which are internal. You've got your opportunities and threats external. Asking Eric from experience on the strengths and weaknesses, the internal, what is the biggest internal block that you've seen in scaling a business? I am going to answer that in a small with a small business in mind, and most of the people who I engage with, and most of my own experience is with owners, not mm -hmm. 
other leaders inside the organization. So I'm going to specifically right. think about owners when I say mm -hmm. this. Um, one of the biggest roadblocks that almost always starts off in the weakness category is is your mindset. It's it's the the understanding and the belief that you have to run the business and do the business. Mm -hmm. And if you can adjust your mindset from basically, I, I'll I'll draw a distinction between entrepreneurs and business owners. A business owner is somebody who can create a business, run it well, build this thing, um, generate clients and revenue and profit and all of this. And they're needed. Their presence is needed for it mm -hmm. to happen. An mm -hmm. entrepreneur is someone who, instead of doing the jobs, creates the jobs and they mm. can leave and it still mm -hmm. works. And so mm -hmm. that's kind of a, it's, it's a little bit of a simplified distinction, but that's how I tend to think about the distinction between a business owner and an entrepreneur. And right. so um, I think one of the one of the struggles that a lot of business owners have is seeing themselves as an entrepreneur where they don't need to be needed in their own organization. And that is a weakness, I would, I would say. It's a weakness to the individual and their own personal life. It's a weakness to the business and its longevity and the ability for it to be sold or acquired someday without uh, being without the owner or founders being needed. Um, it's it's a it's a weakness. Uh, the goal in my mind is to turn that into a strength to change that mindset. And um, I'll probably do this a few times in our conversation. Here's the first book I'll reference. Uh, okay. For me, the the big the big shift was when I was nudged to read the classic uh, Michael Gerber book, The E Myth. And uh, he wrote that in the 80s, uh, and it's still a, a great, great book, great resource. And in it, he, he describes the three roles or the three hats that a business owner creates or has rather when they create a business. And it's the technician where you're mm -hmm. doing the work. It's, it's in the manager, managing people and managing processes. And then lastly, mm -hmm. it's the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And um, that book helps me change my mindset from one of needing to build a business that I will run and mm -hmm. kind of really runs me to building a business that has jobs that I have created that I'm not needed to fulfill long term. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's um, it might feel like a little bit of a simple answer, but the our mindset as an owner is a huge, huge barrier to scaling a business beyond ourselves. So and what, just uh, to for everybody listening, can you repeat the title and author once more? Yes, the book is called The E-Myth, and the, the author is Michael Gerber. Okay, and in summary, to your point about internal blocks to scaling a business would be uh, the entrepreneur mindset where you create jobs rather than you are simply doing the job, uh, rather more like a craftsman or craftswoman. However, you find that a lot of people will see this as a negative or this makes them not important. So it's really about correcting that mindset and seeing themselves in the relationship to their creation, the business, in, in the right way in order to see that they are greatly valuable in that specific way of creating jobs rather than being the craftsman or craftswoman on the day-to-day -day basis. Is that good? It is, yeah, yeah. And okay. not it's, and not everybody, not every owner's placement and journey will be the same. Some people <laughs> discover that they really have a passion and fire for the technician roles or in that craft. Mm -hmm. And part of their decision-making is to create jobs of people who actually manage them and, right. and that's that's a, I've got friends who do that in their business. They are the founder, and they're mm -hmm. at like the second or third tier of a hierarchy. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it's you know mindset, telling yourself what you what is and is not possible is, is really important. Brilliant. So now conversely, um, just and I, and you've listened to some of the episodes for those of people who know Good Morning Market is. We talk about all kinds of different things, but a, a lot of the focus of this podcast is talking about what's happening um, outside of your four walls, outside of your control. Um, internal is most important. Nevertheless, there are opportunities and threats that are happening on a national scale with the economy, a global scale rather, uh, different market forces, things happening in your local community. There will always be the outside world. You know, you can have all the mindset you want to, but you still got to come into contact with uh, things and, and forces outside of your control. What would you say is the biggest external block for entrepreneurs scaling a business? So, this is a really great question that I I have to admit, Philip, I don't feel really qualified to answer. And I think partially it's because I haven't butted up against this yet. Hmm. Um, I've had 
uh, more opportunity to scale than I've had problems scaling so far. Mm -hmm. I -hmm. don't know how much that relates back to the first question, which is mindset. Um, We've Mm -hmm. definitely hit issues, Mm -hmm. but as an example, COVID changed a lot of businesses. That was a very external event. Um, We we, uh, acknowledged and realized on my agency side, Focus Lab, that you know we need to target a slightly different market right now. We okay. need to we need to hone in on the market we already serve, but the slice of it who see this season as an opportunity to invest in their growth because they know that a lot of other people are are scared and fearful yeah. of investing. And so mm-hmm. we we changed based on outside influence, um, mm-hmm. but it didn't. You know, we 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 had a we had a really great. Uh, um, we kind of accelerated through that turn, if you will. And yep. um, things are great on the other side of that for us. Um, I don't I don't know that I've had enough experience and or training to actually mm-hmm. speak well into big, consistent external threats to businesses broadly. Um, but I can say external threats always come mm-hmm. and how we respond to them for me so far has been more important than knowing precisely what the external threat will be. Now, I, I actually think that you will probably have some insight for me on this question. You, you probably are thinking about this in a way that I wouldn't think of mm-hmm. yet. So uh, I'd love if if you have any of your own thoughts on the topic, uh, if you have anything that you would want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that just going back to business principles, it's, it's not so much that I like the mentality that I think you're really hinting at is you really think about your own house and what you can control. And if you really focus hard on that and in, in turning your dream into a vision, your vision into a plan, your plan into action, that uh, I'll, the external world may be secondary. I think that maybe we're business leaders who have a hard time scaling their business. If it's the external blocks, it's more likely going to be that they really don't know the market or don't know the customers as well as they should. Because like I talk about when I do certain business classes, that uh, business is a tango between the business and then the customer. You have to really understand who is your customer, what do they want, what are their alternatives before you came into their life, and how can you best sell your vision and why you exist and why you can solve their problem the better that you can understand the external world in order to cater to the external world because that's what a business is is your house doing something for someone else's house i think it's more so just understanding that world and understanding your your niche goldilocks customer in order to best if you can better better understand that external then you can better construct your own internal house to solve their problems Yeah. And even as you describe that, you know, I I hear the description of the external realities, um, Mm -hmm. but the way you framed it almost felt like an internal uh, action plan, which is you you talked about needing more knowledge about the audience and needing Mm -hmm. needing to gather things because you internally don't have something yet. Um, Mm -hmm. So um, I think maybe there's maybe there's some overlap in in some of the questions there. No, 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 good. And I, I'm glad that you're able to to touch on that because I mean, once again, you've you work with business uh, entrepreneurs who are really striving to scale their businesses and and make a bigger impact. You've obviously been able to do that uh, yourself. So uh, you talked about the mindset change, and I've heard of this in in other thought leaders about uh, you know at some point in time someone starts a widget shop and they're really good at making widgets and they started the widget shop and they every customer that they have knows them by name and they directly have serviced them for years and like things are this way and like you are the business and the business is you and you know you might as well just say you know it's widget shop incorporated but it could very well be bob russell you know incorporated at some point in time if you want to scale like you said you have to think about creating jobs rather than doing jobs how, how or what are some of the important elements into shift, both in terms of you see the timing is right, or maybe it's a mindset thing and going from working in your business to working on your business? Yeah, I, I love this topic so much, and I love chances to talk p- directly and personally to, to to business owners and entrepreneurs who are who are trying to navigate this because it's it's really common for people to start a business to mm-hmm. see and experience success but then get to this point where they are just worn out and worn down because they're doing too much. But the business is working from the outside looking in. Things yeah. things look like they're going well, but the mm-hmm. owner is just beat down or the owners yeah. are beat down. So there's absolutely a need 
to be able to work on your business and not in your business as much. Um, the, the, the common things that come up are, and I've, I've heard you speak a little bit about this as well. Um, first, I, I tend to start from the inside out. And so you even referenced it here in this conversation already, how we identify with our business. Are we the business? Mm -hmm. If we feel like we are the business, we got to start there and say, well, if we are the business, the business has a lid, a very, very tangible physical lid. Um, yeah. However, if the business is not us, if we're not the business, then what does it mean and what could it look like to have a business that I am part of and yeah. that I happen to own? And yeah. in that regard, you have to start thinking about, well, who who else really is needed and who else can do the things that I maybe am needed for right now uh, because we can work on our craft or on our widgets uh, all day and all night. And, and in many cases, we actually started the business because we loved that thing. But the yeah. the mechanics of running a business in most cases is not why we started the business. Um, yeah. And so we need some time to get outside of the business or outside of the system that we're in mm -hmm. to evaluate how it's going. And if yeah. we don't intentionally make space and time for that thing, then we're never going to really be able to get a good picture of how things are going. What, yeah. where, can, where are my opportunities to even run a decent SWOT analysis? You have to get outside mm -hmm. or above your business to do those things. Yeah. And a really common problem that we see in small business is that as owners, we do we wear so many hats willingly. We feel like we, we're told culturally that that's part of the that's part of the gig. You have to wear all the hats and you have to always right. be running. But then we we build our finances in a way often that makes it just work. Like it works mm -hmm. well, um, but we're not like you know um, leaving ourselves enough margin to hire people. For us to step out of, of business. So, a quick example: if I'm if I'm working away 60, 78 hours a week, and I need another widget maker, mm -hmm. but I actually spend all the time making the widgets. My, I, I'm an owner, so I'm not. I don't have any payroll costs really built in, any additional payroll costs built in right. to produce the exact amount of widgets I'm producing now. But if I want to step outside in, of my business and work on it, I still need my widgets being made. And so, to hire somebody to produce those widgets. That's, it's going to feel like all cost because they're just going to produce the things that I was already producing. Right. And so we can, we can work ourselves if we're not careful into a financial position where it feels like it's just complete cost to work mm -hmm. on the business, to get out of the widget making. And so yeah. that's, a, that's a common issue that, that we have to figure out and how to work through. Sometimes finances can be a barrier to mm -hmm. realizing that we should and can work on our business. Um, so there are a lot of different layers, um, mm -hmm. but... One of the things that has been helpful for me is to start building in time to not produce the widget or not provide the service. Yep. For me, it started with one hour every Thursday that I committed to just thinking about working on my business. And this also came from the E-Myth, the book I referenced earlier. That he okay. talked about that phrase, <clears throat> working on the business and not in the business. That one hour block turned to four hours on Thursdays. That four hours later turned to a full Thursday. And then I got to a point where I'm do, I'm I'm spending almost more time working on my business than I'm working in my business. And then mm -hmm. it became businesses mm -hmm. because I started to transition from business owner to more of kind of entrepreneur. So biggest suggestion for me is when it comes to transitioning into having time and space to work on your business is to just start with a time block. Commit to it 30 minutes a week, an hour a week, whatever you can. And then start to adjust your business to where you can afford to spend and invest that time more and more uh, as an owner and then, you know, entrepreneur. I think that's a very uh, simple, effective, repeatable process to work yourself through. I think what is, and you, you've touched on it, is a very emotional uh, struggle. You know, I, I even look at my business and like my soul insights is in many parts a reflection of who I am. It's a reflection on personality and my interests my passions and like you, you we all talk about how we work too much for our business but there are some there are a lot of those entrepreneurs that that serial you know kind of just workaholic dreamer person who loves doing all the things and loves being in there and to give away 
if you give away parts of your business in terms of the operations, in a way you're giving away parts of ownership. You don't own that customer relationship the same way anymore. You don't own that design process or that operation the same way. So it's a very emotional decision. But once again, if you also want to your business to work for you rather than you, you working for your business, if you really want to scale, um, Eric's, uh, Eric's advice here is very uh, cogent to, to actually going through that journey. So to that point, you, you've referenced and alluded to your business and then businesses. Maybe you could summarize for us some of your entrepreneurial background and, and how did you end up scaling it beyond yourself? Mm. So uh, about 12 years ago, I started Focus Lab, uh, a brand agency, um, started it in Savannah. I had a, a co-founding partner and he and I worked together for a few years before that. And when we met, we were both doing web design and um, uh, building websites. Okay. When we met, we both realized pretty quickly he was way better at design than he was at the building, and I was way better at the building than I was at the design. So mm -hmm. we kind of like, you know, with our forces combined, started doing better work. And it got to a point where we had enough mostly local business uh, where we could uh, keep food on the table and mm -hmm. launch into full-time self-employment. And I'm really abbreviating the story in the interest of time, but that's what we did in uh, May of 2010. And we started to just look around, most cases in a virtual or digital sense, look around at other people doing similar services to us and started to see some patterns in how they were growing. And we just started to try to mimic them and say, mm -hmm. well, this seems to work for them, but can it work for me? And so what, what started us in our just general growth was what has now become called content marketing. We were mm -hmm. just blogging a lot. We were just writing, mm -hmm. answering people's questions, helping people, writing our process and sharing it freely. Um, and people would see that and either come to us for work, to, to hire us for design development work, or people in the same field knew of us because we kept sharing knowledgeable, helpful information and they would refer people to us. Mm -hmm. And that helps us grow but that growth was just more services that we were providing and doing the work ourselves. Yeah. Um, it was probably a few years later, 2015-ish maybe, uh, where I've really got to that point, we're coming in on five years old, um, where I knew I needed um, to start letting go of certain types of work. And it then became a process. Um, we um, tried to start a couple of other uh, initiatives or brands or even a, a separate business at one point, um, mm -hmm. learning lots and lots of lessons. But really for me, the thing that that I would say was one of the most pivotal moments was encountering um, a system called EOS. It's an acronym. It stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. And I saw it on your social media that you're going to be checking out. I can't, was it Traction? Is that the Traction. one? Traction. Traction. Okay. Yeah. So we 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 encountered this and, and saw that um, there is a, a pretty repeatable simple process that we can follow to to um capture the processes of our business and delegate them very appropriately and like you said a minute ago give ownership to other people and then it became a trial and error practice process we we would just capture our process and then hand it to somebody who was on the team and say this this is yours now and and philip every time we do it it gets better people <laughs> Like right. I, I keep telling my my team um, that my biggest job is to get out of their way. <laughs> I may have started some of this stuff, yes, but in many cases, I actually need to get out of the way because right. they were hired for a reason. Mm -hmm. And we've gotten really, really good at hiring at Focus Lab. And um, the people on this team are phenomenal. So the more I can get out of the way and share or or hand them ownership of something, the better that the organization will continue to be. So at this point, I've just been practicing that um, more and more. And mm -hmm. um, there's some language from another book, a uh, short book called Who Not How. And that's something that is a catch, a quick, simple to remember catchphrase uh, mm -hmm. is also helpful from an entrepreneurial perspective to just think it's not about how to get certain things done for a business. It's about who should get them done. And so mm -hmm. one of the big uh, ingredients to scaling beyond me, beyond Eric, is if I think of a new idea, a new service, a new widget, rather mm -hmm. than say, how do I go do that? How do I bring it to market? How do I research the market? I'm going to say, mm -hmm. who's going to research the market? Who's going to bring that to the market? 
who on the team is going to do certain things. And sometimes the who is internal, sometimes the who is external. But the key is thinking the who and not trying to go down the how path so much. So that's a now quick that, overview right. and glimpse into that for me. But that must be quite uh, a paradigm shift to get to the point where you can have a, a eureka moment or uh, inspiration, but then you don't go down the rabbit hole. You're like, hey, I'm here's here's a new vision or a new inspiration, and I'll have a team member that I will empower to go. Because then, in a way, they're getting to define where that vision right. or inspiration goes, and you you give away that ownership. But you, like you said, because you're bringing in people who are better at you and were hired uh, for very specific reasons, because they all have different talents to bring to to the table. You, as the scaler, just are in a totally different mindset in terms of how something goes from your head to your customer or client. Completely different paradigm as you scale up. That's right, and and you know. Uh, another quick thing to mention is that, and this applies to to small things, not just big, but I, I've tried to learn and to practice to delegate the results and not the the process uh, okay. or the steps. And okay. and it'll, you, you have to have the right the right who, the right person mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. be able to do that successfully. You can't just say, um, "All right, person fresh out of high school, fresh out of college degree, you're going to go and do these things." You, you need to have somebody who's capable, competent, has the capacity, and all that stuff. That was a good alliteration off the top of my head. That was nice. Um, so you need you need the right person uh, to actually go and fulfill that. But really, delegating results rather than delegating mm -hmm. steps is is a key kind of um, distinction there. Okay. Yeah. Some time, some other time, I, I'd love to go down the rabbit hole of that whole uh, content marketing, uh, being helpful and 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 like big, uh, establishing yourself as the thought leader. I'm sure that there was a way you develop affinity along the way, which is talked about a lot about how you mm -hmm. endear yourself through that process. So that that's a really cool journey. But unfortunately, we we'll have to keep the pace moving because I want to pepper you with some other stuff. Let's yeah. talk a little bit about some more aspects to scaling your business, um, and just as you've been speaking on. So uh, I've gotten this in different ways, and I have an interesting little acronym that I think of. There's a lot of different aspects that a business owner uh, who wants to be a scaler needs to take into account. And I use the three Ps just because we all need Ps. It would be process, people, and products. That uh, technology background is we used to talk about that in terms of like stuff like cybersecurity uh, footprint. Mm -hmm. You have to have these different aspects to protect an organization. Um, when I mean process, I mean more so how do you how do you create systems or uh, have good systems, maybe like an EOS, to help keep everybody on the right track to be effective and efficient. Okay, there's people you talked about who not the who not the what or who not the how in the book who reference. How. Yeah, who not how. So obviously people, most people can grasp onto that people culture. We're especially talking about this a lot as we have the. Uh, labor shortages across the nation. People are really honed in on getting the right kind of people and being able to maintain that standard despite the challenges there. And then products mm -hmm. that could easily take you and I both down the marketing product of the marketing matrix. I meant so in terms of something that doesn't get talked about enough. I talked with Jennifer Abshaw in a previous episode about this is um, technology. There, one other way that to scale a business beyond yourself is people who are both your most expensive and your most powerful asset. But then, come on, it's the 21st century. It's the 2020s, friends. Like, there's so many tools to help us uh, gain that automation and efficiency to uh, expand the power and impact of each individual team member. So, in from your reflection as a coach, mm -hmm. as an entrepreneur. What are some of your thoughts on process, people, and then product slash tools that you think factor into that scale? Yeah, um, process, you're going to see that woven into any decent business system. So EOS, we've re referenced just a little bit, uh, entrepreneurial mm -hmm. operating system. Um, mm -hmm. The book Traction uh, is, is where you go to kind of get the deep dive on that. It has six different components where they say you should be running your business and thinking about these six key things. And one of those six is process. Another mm -hmm. common one is scaling up. There's Rockefeller habits. Um, there's mm -hmm. a book called scaling up that, that includes saying, you know, you need to capture processes and keep them updated. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there are other systems out there, but they all are going to at some point say you, you have to capture your most important processes. And it's so interesting at this point, focus lab is 12 years old. I can't imagine focus lab existing without our documented processes at this point. However, it's still relatively new in our 12 years. Maybe the past four years, we've had mm -hmm. everything 
um, um, working towards uh, written written documentation. It helps with our onboarding of new team members. It mm-hmm. helps with consistency. It helps us just remind ourselves of maybe a couple of things that are less commonly executed or done than others. Um, and not having to reinvent something every time you have to do it saves yeah. a tremendous amount of time. And it makes yes. things much more scalable. So we we I'll, I'll stick with EOS for just a minute. We started to... Yeah implement EOS in um, maybe 2017 or 18, something like that. And we were, um, during COVID, we were about a 20, 19, 20 person team. And we, so we had a, a couple of year, year and a half or so running on EOS. And basically my goal after I read Traction, I devoured that book because I was just like, I think I found the thing that I need mm-hmm. to scale. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I recognize that there, it gives me a foundation on which I can I can build and scale faster than what I have today, which is or back then, which was not much thing, not many things documented, not complete clarity on what it, what's a good fit for a person at Focus Lab. There are just so many different things that I was lacking. EOS allowed us to solidify a foundation, and then at this point we've gone from that 19 to closing in on 40 in the past couple of years, and you wouldn't know it. Because I mean, you would know it because our Zoom boxes in our meetings they're a lot smaller because they're a lot more. Right. Of us. Um, <laughs> but but from a from a culture experience, yeah. most companies really break stuff when they grow like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, EOS gave us the foundation, a lot of which had to do with the process mm-hmm. that that made it very very easy to go from you know twenty to forty and and actually get better than yeah. than and like on all counts. It's mm-hmm. it's really wonderful. Um, so process has been huge. Uh, people, um, you know, I, I, a lot of people point back to Jim Collins and his book, Good to Great, where he he talked mm-hmm. about how important it is to get the right people in the right seats on the bus. And mm-hmm. that's been a great analogy for us. We It's also woven into EOS. So, you know, it, it's one of the most important things to me at Focus Lab and also at my new business, Built on Purpose, is to have people aligned. And mm-hmm. that goes down to knowing your core values. It goes down to knowing why the business even exists in the first place and does it exist to go beyond the owner or not. Um, right. And so having clarity around what it means to be on the right bus, what are those core values? Having the mm-hmm. right people, are the right people assigned to the roles? Are they in places where they can thrive and succeed and bring value? Um, and then when it comes to the the products, the the tools we use, the the technology that we have in place, you know, that one, I... I um, it's hard for me to speak to it because I have such a limited view, which is that I, I have been in a technology world my whole life. Like to me, yeah. it's a very natural thing to think about automating things. Right. So I want to be, I want to be conscientious of that in my, in the way I speak to it, because that's definitely not everybody's experience, especially in a small business. Mm-hmm. So I would just simply say, you can probably figure some process and people stuff out well in a, mm-hmm. like a leadership team context within an organization. Mm-hmm. Tools, technology, automation, product stuff, like you might actually need to go outside your organization to really figure that yeah. stuff out. That's right. where, I mean, consultants can also be hired for process capturing and creation and yeah. people for fu- culture mm-hmm. stuff. But but really for AI, for automation, for those things, I know there are a lot of small business owners who are like, I have no clue where to start. And so right. where I would say to start is find a professional who does it for a living and then right. have them speak into how that can help your scalability long term. One hundred percent. Thank you for make you know going over a large um, area very succinctly for us. And yeah, you know, I would I would second your motion, especially about the tools automation process because you're really you're doing things the hard way. It's just like you know when you do one craft like with a an old school hammer and nail, and then you start you know building stuff with a nail gun. It's come on, come on. Tools really, really help. Right. But once again, it's a whole different world. It's best to go look for specialists who are really good can bring those uh, those those things to bear. But that, I feel like that helps people scale a lot smarter, more efficiently. Um, I think what I'm learning here is. Guys like you, you know, and other great business leaders that I've spoke to, y'all make it sound so easy, but it's not. Nor do I think you're saying it. It is easy. It's just, yeah. it's tough. I think that that's why, Grizzly, like you're great, is because you can help us take all this stuff and and make it digestible. But um, you know, I feel like failure in trying things and and failing and figuring it out is part of any entrepreneurial journey who wants to become a scaler. However. Mm-hmm. 
we also need books. We we don't want to reinvent the wheel, as you stated earlier. And there is this burgeoning place, and I feel like more people are becoming aware of the need for coaches and mentors. So before we talk about kind of your new venture, can you help me understand the why uh, for for people to appreciate if you want to grow a business, it really, really helps to have a coach and a mentor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, kind of in the same way that it's hard to work on your business while you're in your business, it's really hard mm -hmm. to work on yourself when you are yourself. Um, mm -hmm. you, you, There's a point that all of us hit, m myself included, where I, I can't coach myself. I, I can't I can't see a perspective from the outside of me very well, mm -hmm. if at all. Mm -hmm. So in, in at this at its simplest form, I, I know that I need a coach to help me see things that I don't see. I need a mentor to help me see ahead to things that I can't see ahead to. Um, so and I'm you know I'm using the words coach and mentor in, in different distinct ways there. Um, okay. It, it's something that is not as common as I wish it was. I, I, I even myself kind of got into seeking out mentors and coaches later than I wish I had. Mm -hmm. But at this point, I can't imagine not having somebody um, outside of me speaking into me. And yeah. sometimes all that person does is they just hold up a mirror and said, you just said these six things. What do you think about those six things you just said? I'm like, oh, yeah, I did say that, didn't I? Like, but right. but I wouldn't have had that without somebody on the other side of me. So yep. that's a real simple answer, kind of in mm -hmm. the interest of time. But we can't mm -hmm. can't coach ourselves. We can't we can't see things when we are us sometimes. Yeah, piggybacking on what you said, I was on YouTube and I I saw Dave Ramsey talking about this, and he described entrepreneurs. I feel like you know very helpful. And he said entrepreneurs are slightly different than leaders. Entrepreneurs like we're constantly we're dreamers. There's constantly a butterfly. We've got all these different things. I feel like that's one factor, and really uh, valuing a mentor and a coach because they can kind of keep you anchored. Another thing that I think about in terms of the the value, and and this is for myself actually something I'm I'm looking to develop those relationships, and I've been told many a time from the very time I started my business, you need mentors. Uh, people will tell you very wisely so that you know you are who you hang out with. If you hang out with a bunch of people who don't who don't have much money, you shouldn't be surf surprised if you also find yourself in that boat. However, if you aspire to really do a lot of wealth building. It probably would help if you started to hang out and seek circles where people are really good at building wealth. In the same vein, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to be a scaler, you probably should seek relationships with people who have gone before you and have successfully scaled. And I feel like that's exactly what a coach uh, and a mentor for your business does. And I feel like the third thing I was going to piggyback on what you said was I feel like it helps. You need an objective voice to keep you accountable, but I feel like just as much, if not more so, you need that objective experience voice to talk you down because the self-sabotage and the lonely island is entrepreneurship, especially when most people in your life probably are not also entrepreneurs so they can't relate. It can be a very dark, isolated place if you don't have someone that you can lean on in those those solitary times. Right, yeah. And you know, um, I think it's, I've heard John Maxwell say that if you're lonely at the top, then you're doing it wrong. Um, <laughs> it, you, you have yeah. to be bringing people with you and you have to have be looking for people around you. And um, it, I, I like I, I like your reference to that idea that you know you're the average of the five people around you in so many different contexts because mm -hmm. I, I have seen that play out in my life for sure, um, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons that every so often I try to take stock and just kind of look around who am I spending the most most of my time with, uh, who am I learning from the most, and books books fit into that for me too. I find mentorship yeah. in the pages of of books all the time, mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, that's been a that's been a big a big big role for for sure for me. So you've obviously been reflecting on this both in terms of experience and learning from others who came ahead of you. Um, I'm guessing that be, might be part of the reason why there's a, a new pretty new enterprise and venture called Built on Purpose, which you founded. People, I'm going to put all the information in the show notes. Um, in that vein and spirit, what is Built on Purpose? Built on Purpose uh, is a new leadership development and coaching organization. And um, I'm able to basically take the things that I now do inside of Focus Lab with the team there from a teaching, training, coaching perspective. And I'm able to take that outside to other places as well. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's really 
what I am most passionate about in, in this business, in this kind of, not even business, just in general. My wife likes to joke that she's married to um, uh, a coach because sometimes our conversations, I accidentally start to go into like, that's just, it's just who I am. That's just how yeah, I yeah. like to have conversations that <laughs> I, I couldn't even answer your question about reading without going into yeah. coaching. So, um, you know, it, it's just, um, it took me a, a while to find that about myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but once I realized that that's where I feel like I was made to, to operate, uh, I started to try and get as much of my time at focus lab in that realm. And then, uh, realize that there's a lot of other opportunity to do the same types of things uh, through an additional organization. And with that who, not how mentality to build mm -hmm. something bigger than myself that mm -hmm. is able to, it allows me to leverage the things I've learned uh, and even simplified. You, uh, you, you kind of mentioned this a minute ago, but one of the things that I've, I think I've been able to do uh, for a number of people is, is consume a bunch of books with a bunch of stuff um, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then crystallize it or simplify it down. And I would say that I don't do anything that is um, complex. It's all mm -hmm. very simple, but it's not mm -hmm. easy. And so mm -hmm. my role through Built on Purpose is to to go into other organizations, predominantly with leadership teams, and, mm -hmm. and help them uh, become better leaders themselves and develop better leaders inside their organizations. And to do that with some of the simplified approaches that I've uh, just learned and developed um, through my my years at Focus Lab, um, so it's predominantly focused on leadership development, coaching, training, and okay. uh, as you know, early stage of a business, you have some decisions to make. Who's your market? Mm -hmm. Who are you serving? Mm -hmm. I'm still navigating that myself for Built on Purpose. For right now, mm -hmm. where I'm trying to focus my energy is on remote and distributed workforces because that's right. a rising market. I yeah. have a, a tremendous amount of experience in that field in that workspace. And yep. the challenges and opportunities for leadership development, it's a little different than it is yep. in the traditional workspace. Brilliant, brilliant. So I, I'm, I'm very excited to see uh, where you're going with that. Uh, just from looking at our website and our conversation today, I'm, I'm very, very confident we'll be hearing bigger and bigger things. But, you know, bigger things off in the future. Let's talk about big things now. You, you've got it, uh, I saw it in the announcements and, and, the, and the publicity right off the get-go is there's this $1.5 million launch related to uh, charitable absolution of medical debt. Please, please provide a, a brief story of, around what you're doing through Built on Purpose to alleviate uh, $1.5 million in, in debt. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I am early enough into Built on Purpose where uh, I'm still finessing how I talk about it. And so it's kind mm -hmm. of hitting me right now in this moment that I should have mm -hmm. also mentioned one of the main reasons that it even exists is for us to give a lot of money away. I okay. actually am, I have a I have a, a 10 year goal to give away $5 million to nonprofits in our, you and I respective region, you know, Southeast mm -hmm. Georgia, uh, mm -hmm. predominantly in Savannah surrounding area. Um, mm -hmm. to give away money to nonprofits and not to do it to raise money, but to like have earned the revenue to give mm -hmm. away and send mm -hmm. out into the community. So that is a 10 year goal of mine and mm -hmm. desire and even hunger of mine to just impact an area. Um, and to launch the business, I wanted to launch with something that spoke to that, that vision. And mm -hmm. so I partnered up with a nonprofit called RIP medical debt and RIP medical. They, buy debt on the secondary market and they do it, you know, mm. when you buy debt like that, you're buying for mm -hmm. often pennies on the dollar mm -hmm. and, and they allow people to raise money and basically abolish that debt with no penalty to the former debt owner, the person who actually had that medical debt on their shoulders. And they specifically focus on people who are at four times the poverty line uh, mm -hmm. or, or worse off with their household annual income or where the debt is more than, um, I can't remember the ratio off the top of my head, but five, those are the kind of parameters. Yeah. Five times? Something. I think that I saw the number five there, but yeah, I, I yeah, it was yeah. like five. And, yeah. And I, I've had the opportunity five to Five percent or more of their annual income. Five percent of their, that's what it is. Thank you. Right. Um, I've had the opportunity to work, uh, or to, to be a part of a campaign with RIP in the past. And mm -hmm. just, it's remarkable the the impact that this has on people. Um, so basically the, the debt is, is, is written off it's gone completely and the person doesn't owe anything like they would if it was like a gift given to them with the irs and they get a letter in the mail comes in a blue envelope they read it it says hey this is rip medical debt this is what our organization does and so and so 
had a campaign and your debt has been purchased, paid for, and is completely gone. And that, I mean, just the, the, the responses that people send in to RIP medical when this kind of stuff happens, it's just unreal. So the $1.5 million is the goal for the debt that we can abolish. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it could take up to about $15,000 of funds raised to do that. Mm -hmm. But think about that. $15,000 can knock out $1.5 million in debt. And so by working with RIP Medical Debt, we're able to focus that on even our region in mm -hmm. Georgia, in the Savannah area and surrounding yes. counties. And so that's what we're doing. We we actually just wrapped the campaign. And I'm, as you and I record this, we're actually in the middle stage where they're compiling everything. And within the next mm -hmm. week or two, I'll know the result of how much debt we're able to to knock off um, by what was raised. So I'm, I'm excited. I'm anticipating kind of what that total is going to be. Um, but that's what we did it for. We wanted to tie it to our long-term vision of sending $5 million into the into the community through different nonprofits. And, and RIP Medical was a great partner to start that with. Awesome. So I, I, I'm excited for everything I'm hearing and genuinely want to uh, see how we can learn more, point people to you and what you're doing there with Built on Purpose, both for their own growth and, but, and also for uh, your mission with RIP. Uh, last question, I, give you, I got one, only one rapid fire, but it is one that I always like to ask. What is one thing in your opinion that people who own a business or trying to scale a business should stop doing right now? Ooh, what is one thing that they should stop doing? Mm -hmm. Um, so you'll you yeah you, you've you've referenced this for yourself. You tend you tend to be a deep thinker. I am too, which is makes rapid fire questions really difficult. Um, uh, leaving email open all day. Oh crap. I didn't. I don't. I didn't want to get like attacked on my own podcast, but okay. Let's let's hear it. I had to keep it general. That that, that seems to apply to a whole <laughs> bunch of people. Yeah. Dang it, man. You know, you remind me of a, a sales book that I read, and he said, you know, one of the worst things you can do is start your workday off with, you know clicking through your email. He's always like, you know, you should use the beginning of your workday to write down on the piece of paper the and you, you know, you, you do your big things in the morning and it's so easy for us to go to the comfort of email. It's always there, that constant distraction. I even get into it with my phone because there's always another ding coming. So, mm -hmm. um, Eric convicting us about, uh, getting out of the zone too easily through that email fix. So, um, I feel you there. Uh, with that being said, uh, and I've been officially attacked on my own show, how can folks connect with Eric Regan to learn more about Built on Purpose, your your uh, your RIP connection, Focus Lab, wherever you want to take it, people need to connect with you. We need to hear it. Yeah. Uh, basically, all social media stuff, minus TikTok, I haven't gotten in there yet, uh, is just at Eric Regan. It's E R I K R E A G A N. That's the handle on any of those social platforms. Uh, yep. And then built on purpose is uh, at built on purpose HQ because built on purpose was not available. So, you know, it is what it is. Um, and then focus lab agency is my agency website. You can find lots of different ways to connect with us there. Lovely. Eric, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. Like I genuinely love this for me. And I know for a fact that um, our audience uh, got pointed in the right direction. You helped take something that's a lifelong journey and it's it's tough, but it's worth it. And you helped make our task a little bit easier and clearer for us as we wrap up 2022. Thank you so much for joining the program and I wish you all the best success. Awesome. Thanks, Philip. I appreciate the opportunity.